Well, good morning, church family, and happy Mother's Day to you. I hope that you're uh, enjoying your morning so far as we look forward to uh, spending some time together this morning singing, uh, reading the Word together, and uh, studying the Word as well. I just want to remind you of a couple of things. First of all, uh, we are recording this on uh, what actually would be uh, David Otema's birthday. Many of you remember David, our friend from Uganda. He went on to be with the Lord almost one year ago, just a few weeks after his, uh, after his birthday. And uh, it reminded me to remind you to be praying for our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world who are really dealing with a lot of adversity at this point. Of course, specifically, our brothers and sisters in the northern part of Uganda, not only, remember a few weeks ago, did they deal with the uh, wildfire that took the church building, but uh, they've also been hit very hard with this uh, COVID-19 quarantine. And uh, on top of that, they've had this plague of locusts that have come through and have just obliterated uh, their food supply. Uh, while we don't normally do this, we are going to reach out and try to get them some emergency food supplies. And so those of you who are wanting to donate towards that can just send a donation to Spread of Grace Ministries and mark that emergency food relief. And uh, we will get that and get that on to our friends in Uganda. Particularly, we're looking at ways that we can help our friends in Ethiopia as well. So if you'll just send that to Spread of Grace Ministries at 125 Calvary Church Road in Wrightsville, 17368, we will make sure that that goes uh, for that need. This is now, I guess, the eighth week uh, that we are not meeting physically together. And I just want to remind you to be praying for the elders as we try to think through uh, how, what, when we will be able to meet again, trying to weigh everything. Nobody is, is an expert uh, at, at this. Uh, and so we're just trying to carefully consider uh, our response as a church, what that response needs to be. But that causes us to think that the, the reality, even in a church that's not huge, but a church our size, there are going to be different opinions, differing perspectives on how we ought to handle our response to uh, the recommendations that have been set for us regarding our meeting. And I just want you to be careful, to be careful to be, uh, to be sensitive toward the response, the perspectives, the opinions of others, because no doubt there will be many different perspectives, even within our church family. So keep that in mind as, you're, as you relate one to another. Doesn't mean that your opinion, your perspective is wrong. Doesn't mean that your perspective or your opinion is the only right one. We as elders are seeking to sort of work through all of these things. And we hope that in the next few days or a few weeks, we'll have some, some leadership, some guidance for us as regarding a church family as to when uh, we will be able to meet together soon. So uh, be praying uh, let's be loving and sensitive towards one another as we move forward in these days. Thank you, and uh, God bless you as we meet together uh, this morning.
Good morning, saints. As we anticipate the message this morning, we'll be reading from Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. So Genesis chapter 1, and we'll look at beginning in verse 26. Genesis 1 and 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, And over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now over to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 5. Genesis 2 and 5. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. And the mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature, And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Then I'll skip down to verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, I thank you for your word that tells us of how you created, gives us these details and causes us to understand something of who we are as people, made in your image, made as man and woman. Lord, in your great and divine wisdom, you have ordained that man and woman, individually and together, reveal something of your glory, something of your image. Lord, help us to grow in our understanding of what it is to be made in your image and what it is to be made man and woman. Help us to delight in your plan. Help us to to pursue your good intentions. Lord, we know that as a result of sin, our understanding of your world is distorted and our understanding of ourselves is distorted is distorted. Lord, give us humble hearts before your word. Give us open hearts that we might receive the Spirit's work in revealing and changing, that more and more we might grow to be the kind of man and the kind of woman that you have called us to be. Help us to see how distorted our own understanding of who we are as a man or a woman is. Help us to see those distortions in how we look out towards others, to other men and other women. Lord, cause us to delight in your plans and purposes. 
May we have thankful hearts for your redeeming work in us. May we see the good things you have for us as we seek to receive the blessing there is in living in community as men and women. Lord, as we reflect on your word this morning, work in us for your glory. May our hearts delight in your perfect wisdom, in your perfect goodness, and in your saving grace. And we look forward to that time in glory when we will experience our humanity, when we will experience what it is to be man and woman in a, an incredibly delightful and wonderful way. And, and we look forward to how you would be glorified as we live in that reality. We praise you and we thank you in the name of Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Well, this morning, I hope that you were really locked into that scripture reading that Pastor Rodney presented for us. We read from Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, chapters that are, are just absolutely foundational in the Christian faith. These are foundational passages in the Christian faith. In fact, I remind you that Jesus told us in John chapter 5 that if we don't believe Moses' words, the words that we just read, we actually can't believe the words of, of Jesus. So there's some really important truth here, really important stuff for us, for the entire Christian faith. It was nearly 10 years ago that we worked through our study of the book of Genesis. We took about five weeks to actually understand these chapters in, in a study we called The Making of Man. And I want to just take a few moments this morning, if we can, to revisit that text and then try to meld this text together with what I ultimately want to get us to. I ultimately want us to go to 1 Peter chapter 3 to kind of wrap up uh, everything. But this morning, I want us to take a look back at the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, specifically Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. And, and it's one phrase that has really captured my attention. And I, I think it will be really, really uh, foundational, especially to our, our celebration today of, of Mother's Day. The phrase that catches my attention is Genesis 1.27, where it says, male and female, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Now, what you'll find is that this is just a, a, a summary statement, if you will. We'll learn more about this in chapter 2 in just a few moments. But what I want to do is use Genesis 1.27 to present to you the threefold, we'll, we'll call this the threefold design of, of man, the threefold design of humility. When I use the term man, uh, I'm going to use that term sort of generically to refer both to male and female, unless I point it out differently. We're, we're talking about humanity's design, the threefold design of humanity. And the first thing I notice here is humanity's spirituality. Humanity's spirituality. Look at the emphasis on these verses. Genesis 1, 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. We're talking here about what God wants us to know. God wants us to know that humanity is created in God's image. In other words, our very being is patterned after God's image. And, and friends, this is what sets us apart from every other creation of God. Man is created in the image of God. I, I'm emphasizing here the spirituality of man. I'm not speaking of something mystical, you know, something unreal, when we read of man being created in the image of God, this is not speaking of some kind of, uh, of physical form. To be created in the image of God is to be created with, we might say, personhood. It is to be made uh, to, 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 to mirror the character or the being of God. Not that God created another God, but what God did was to create something, namely a person who would have self-consciousness. 
person who would be able to feel emotion and to know the difference between right and wrong, a person who would be able to relate to other people. Man is created, and at the moment that he is created, he becomes eternal. His existence will be an eternal existence that will never be snuffed out. Your life may come to an end on this earth, but your existence will never end. Why? Because you are created in the image of God. And no matter how much sin has marred this image, you can never escape the reality of your spirituality, the reality of you being created in the image of God. But not only do we see emphasized men's or humanity's spirituality, but we see emphasized in this passage humanity's physicality. Humanity's physicality. You remember we read down in Genesis chapter 2, and in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, we read how the Lord formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. God made man out of the dirt. That's really interesting. And we've seen this before, that Genesis is the foundation for Christianity. It is the foundation for everything else that we're going to find throughout the scriptures. You just look at this verse here in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, and you find that God formed man out of the dust. Just, not just dry earth, but probably more like a lump uh, of dirt, a lump of earth. And just like the potter molds the clay, so the Lord molded and made a, a body for this man. N we're not to think that there was some sort of bodiless spirit sort of floating around out there awaiting for a body. No, that's not the case at all. God made the body, and at the moment that the body was formed out of the lump of the earth, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. At that very moment, the man became a living creature, and that's how it happened. God made the body for man. In other words, if I can make this very personal, you were created with the thoughtfulness of the triune God. Your creation involved all of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are not, listen, brothers and sisters, you are not the result of some random combination of chance and fate. You, you are the direct result of the personal involvement of God. You just look at this. Chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, you see the direct personal involvement of God with his great and grand creation. Now listen, you might have just tuned in this morning. Maybe you're not part of our church family. You're just tuning in because uh, uh, it's an opportunity for you. You might have come across this on YouTube or Facebook. Can I say to you very personally that you, my friend, are a direct result of the personal involvement of Almighty God. God stooped down to form man. God stooped down to breathe into him the breath of life, and God put the man in the garden. You see the tender authority of God? You see God's personal involvement with humanity? Humanity as the distinct creation of God distinct from every other creation. That's, that's why we can read in Psalm 139, the psalmist is praising God for his involvement. He says, I'll praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. And my soul knows that very well. Just like your soul is crying out in your heart right now, you know that you are the direct personal result of, of the involvement, the creative involvement of God. Your soul is crying out that, that truth. The psalmist means that, that he has been made as a distinct or distinguished from, from every other creation, every other creature, and he can hardly contain his praise. He can hardly contain his worship. It's too much for him to grasp. And so he just launches out in this paean of praise. So we see humanity's spirituality. You see humanity's physicality. But what stands out to me in this passage that begins here in Genesis 1.27 is humanity's sexuality. 
male and female, he created them. Now, there is a wrong uh, understanding of this verse that, that finds its roots in Jewish lore. Uh, I, I thought about not even bringing that up, but I, I just want to state it here really quickly. And it's the view that when God made Adam, when God made man, that he actually made him asexually. That is to say that he made man both male and female. But that's not what the text says. Chapter 1, verses 26 through 31 is really a summary statement. The details of these verses, chapter 1, verses 26 through 31, the details of those verses are actually going to be spelled out it to us in chapter 2. In other words, one, chapter 1, verses 26 through 31 is just sort of a preview, a preface, an overview. And then the details are hashed out in chapter 2. We're to understand that God made both male and female. Adam was the male. He was created first. And on that very same day, he created Eve, the female. Now, why is this important? Why am I taking time for this? Well, it's important that we understand that the male was created first and that the female was actually taken from his body. It's absolutely necessary. And, and once again, it's another demonstration of the accuracy of the book of Genesis, the accuracy of, of the Bible, the foundation for the Christian faith. You might have already heard about the structure of DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. DNA is the genetic code in every cell, right? How each cell contains this thin strip of coded information consisting of 46 parts or 23 pairs. They're, they're called, uh, those, those parts or those pairs are called chromosomes. Now just stick with me here. Two of these chromosomes, the X and the Y chromosomes, determine whether you are male or female. They, scientists call them the, the sex chromosomes. The X chromosome engenders female. The Y chromosome engenders male. Women, females, have the X chromosome. But males have both the Y chromosome and the X chromosome. The woman always, when there's reproduction, the woman, the female, always contributes an X chromosome. But the man could contribute a Y or an X. If he contributes an X chromosome, a girl will be born. If he contributes a Y chromosome, a man will be born. Man, the male, was created first because the man had the genetic material so that the female could be formed from him and be genetically related to him so that through a relationship with her, the male would be able to produce both males and females and thus he would be able to fulfill the commandment of Genesis 1.28, namely, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. It's amazing how God designed his creation spiritually, physically, and sexually. It might come to a as a surprise to us then to read what we read in chapter 2, verse 18. The Lord said, it is not good for man to be alone. Now remember, this section now contains the details of what just happened on the sixth day that was sort of overviewed for us in chapter one. We've already read about the general account of what took place here on the sixth day of creation, Genesis 1, 26 through 31. And now in chapter two, the Lord God pulls back the curtain, as it were, on the details of the events of that day. After the Lord created man, 
God said, it's not good. After the Lord created the male, he said it is not good that man or the male should be alone. And this is just a stunning revelation. Man, Adam, was not complete in himself. That's what the wording means here in chapter 2, verse 18. Man is not complete in himself. In other words, he's lacking something. Now, what is he lacking? Well, you have this whole scene where God parades all of the animals before Adam. And there is this amazing ability that Adam has to be able to observe the various kinds of animals that God had created to be able to note some distinctive characteristics. And then on the basis of those characteristics, Adam was able to assign a name to them. Adam, let me tell you, Adam was an intellectual genius. And God just brought all of the animals before him so that he might give them a name. And in this way, Adam practiced his dominion. In this way, God revealed a very significant truth to Adam. You see, with each passing animal, Adam noted that each had a partner. But there was not one animal that could be compared to him, that could be Adam's partner, that could be Adam's helper. Now, the purpose of God in doing this, of course, was to reveal the fact to Adam that there was no one who was comparable to him. None of the animals had been or are created in the image of God. And thus, there couldn't be a relationship between man and animal on the spiritual, physical, and sexual level. And this, no doubt, quickly became apparent to Adam. The words are that there was not a helper fit for him. There, there wasn't anything corresponding to him. There wasn't found anything corresponding to Adam, to man. And that's why God creates the woman, the female, the counterpart. Man was not complete. God said is not good, is not complete that there should only be Adam, the man or the male. There is this thought today, I think, especially evident in many uh, men, that is, I, I, and I think we should just address that, the thought that you can just make it on your own. You have this sort of pioneer mentality. We don't need anyone or anything else. And, and then it'd be actually better if we're just alone. And I'm not just referring to the issue of marriage, but of relationships in general. But listen, God says that it is not good. It is not good for man to be alone. Thus, God created the female, the woman, and I want us to see womanhood, or can I say femininity, as God's good design. Is there equality among the sexes? Well, I guess that depends on what you're talking about. Men and women are both created. Men and women are both created in the image of God. Men and women are both created to, to love and live in a world for the glory of God. Men and women are both created morally responsible before God. And, and both are actually sinners before God. But listen, only men can be men and only women can be women. And even though there is a direct effort today to blur the lines between the sexes, we see that this is God's plan for things, God's design. And Adam absolutely treasures God's creation. Look at this beautiful poem here. Genesis chapter 2, verse 23. The man said, At last! Bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. It's a beautiful poem here in this one verse. You can see that the words that Adam speaks here are absolutely dripping with emotion and wonder and awe and gratitude. At last, says Adam. I mean, you can imagine he's, he's saying, finally, after looking at aardvarks and bumblebees and cows and deer and elephants and ferrets and gorillas and hyenas and, and iguanas and jaguars and kangaroos and llamas and mice and possums. 
mean, you could just go on after looking at all of those animals. Finally, Adam says, finally, there's one who's comparable to me. Someone who is made from me. And all day long, Adam on this sixth day, all day long, Adam in his intellectual genius had been noticing the characteristics of the animals and he had been naming them. And he looks at this other person that God created and he notices her characteristics. I don't know if he touched her or what happened. And he says, she shall be called woman. Matt, Adam was called man, ish. That's the word ish. And woman shall be called isha. You know what that means? Soft. That was her characteristic. Beautiful to behold. Lovely to behold. She was the completion of God's creation. Just absolutely amazing. That's what characterized her, her softness, her, her beauty. And that's what caused me to think about another passage of Scripture that I want to go to in the last closing minutes of our time together this morning. 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, if you'll turn there with me. This is a wonderful passage of Scripture and one that I am sure that you are very familiar with. In 1 Peter chapter 3, 3, we read this. Verse 1. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in God's sight. Very precious. This, this is something that is not simply valued or treasured in the sight of men, humanity. But Peter's describing something that is precious and valuable to be treasured in the sight of God. In other words, when God created the female... On that sixth day, he created this female with this idea of preciousness, beauty, something that is to be, something that is to be treasured. And even as Adam on that sixth day noted these wondrous characteristics of woman, can I close today? with noting the four characteristics that are precious in the sight of God, that are valuable in the sight of God, four characteristics that are, are treasured in God's sight regarding the woman. Number one, we see her conduct, her conduct. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here. I'm just going to point this out to you, and maybe you can look at it Later in your own study of the scriptures, you see this emphasis on her conduct at the end of verse 1, that they may be won without a word by the conduct of, her, of their wives. Peter has been pointing this out. Peter has been driving at the characteristics of, of Christians that lead to the, 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 the salvation, that lead to a witness of these Christians in a, in a fallen world. He's talked about sanctification. He's talked about suffering. But now he refers to the relationship between a man and his wife, between a wife and her husband. 
And just generally speaking, we notice the, 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 the conduct that is precious, that is valuable, that is treasured in the sight of the Lord. Much we can point out to here, but I'm just concerned with pointing out the high points. And what we see here is a woman whose conduct, who is characterized as respectful and pure. Fearful and pure. These words that are referred to here in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse, verse 2, when they see your respectful and pure conduct, those words must be referring to a conduct that is conduct before God. It is the fear of God and the resultant holiness or purity, chasteness that comes as a result of the fear of God. Of God. Do you know what is precious in the sight of God? It's a woman, it's a female who fears God and has the resultant chasteness, purity, or holiness. She conducts herself in the fear of God. But secondly, not only do we see her conduct, we see her concern. Her conduct and her concern in verses 3 and 4. Do not let your adorning be external. Don't let your adorning be external. The braiding of, of the hair, putting on of gold jewelry, the, the clothing that you wear. You see, he's talking here not so much about an external beauty, an external adornment, but he's referring to the characteristic of the internal beauty, the inner beauty, the internal adornment. She is not concerned with simply looking nice. It's not, it's not de de deriding that. But he's emphasizing a truth. You, you can talk about taking care of yourself. Obviously, good hygiene and all that kind of stuff. But this, this woman that is beautiful, that is precious, that is, that, is, that is treasured in the sight of God is concerned with what she looks like on the inside, in her heart before God. She's concerned with how she takes care of herself spiritually. And ladies, let me share with you. When you care for yourself on the inside, the effects just show up on the outside. The more beautiful you are on the inside, the more beautiful you will be on the outside. There, there's a world of, of girls today trying to get the attention of men by how they dress and how they dance. They have a fading beauty, a beauty that's not going to last. The wrinkles are going to come. The attraction is going to fade, but this inner beauty, in fact, this inner beauty is what Peter calls not only an inner beauty, but he calls it an imperishable beauty. A beauty, a preciousness that will never pass away. In fact, it will only get more and more beautiful as you grow and mature in Christ. It's not going to go away. It is the imperishable beauty, he says, of a gentle spirit. This is, this is meekness towards God. Meekness that, that accepts his dealings with us as good and therefore without disputing, without resisting. It's an inner spirit of the woman who relies on God's strength and not on her own strength. This is the inner spirit of a woman who recognizes that God is making her what he wants her to, dis to be despite the trials that she must endure. A gentle spirited woman trusts God that he will deliver her in his time. And this is a fruit of the spirit, right? Galatians chapter 5, verse 23. Not only a gentle spirit, but a quiet spirit. This is, this is a reference to the peacefulness, the peaceableness. Because you have a peace with God, you can have the peace of God. You quietly rest in Him. Not argumentative. She quietly rests in God. You see her conduct and now you see her concern. 
But thirdly, you see her character. Her character there in verse 5, he says, For this is how the, and notice what he calls, the holy women. This is how the holy women, this, this is the, the personality, this is her character. Very important, and we have to pay close attention to this. We can't miss this. When, when, when he calls, when he refers to the holy women, I think we can talk about this holiness, and you know this, in, in two ways. We can refer to the positional holiness, our standing before God. Obviously, we're talking about here, our, our standing before God through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, by resting your hope fully in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are positionally holy. You are marked out. You are set aside as holy and pure in the image of God. Have you embraced the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you embraced the gospel? If so, it can be said that you are a holy woman of God. But secondly, this, this not only referring to a position, but referring to practice. He's talking here about the holy women who made a break with the old way of life. Holy, woman, holy women who said goodbye to, to the old way of life, who said goodbye to immorality, who said goodbye to selfishness, just like Sarah. And isn't it interesting that Peter brings Sarah out as an illustration? She had lived in immorality and paganism. She was like her, her husband, Abram. She would have been a moon worshiper. But she came to the point of submitting herself to the Lord God and worshiping Him, set apart, holy, making a break with the old way of life. Ah, oh, you see her conduct. You, you see her, her character, her, her concern. And then you see her character. But fourthly, I want you to notice her confidence. Her confidence in verse 5. This is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves. This is how the holy women of God who hoped in God that's the final characteristic of this, this precious woman in the sight of God. She, she, her confidence is in God. She's trusting in. She's relying on God. She hoped in God. Her trust was, not, it was in God, not in selfish ambition. And he uses the illustration of Sarah calling Abraham or Abram Lord. It's a way of saying that she was willing to submit herself to her God-given calling. And that's exactly what she did. She trusted in the Lord and in Him alone. It means that Sarah was okay with God's promises. She was willing to be the vessel through which God would fulfill His word. And she submitted her, herself to that plan as Abraham's wife. She wasn't trusting Abraham primarily. She was trusting God. And that precious in the sight of God. Dear sisters, I want to encourage you this morning on this Mother's Day. I want to encourage you to see your womanhood, your, your femininity, not as wrapped up in external things, but rather as being summed up by who God created you to be. And girls, young girls, young ladies, I want you to highly value your womanhood, your, your femininity, your girlhood. God made you female in his image for his glory as a good gift. Dear sisters, some of you have children today, and that is a great gift a gift for which we thank the Lord, a blessing that results in our gratitude. But that doesn't define your womanhood. That doesn't define your femininity. Maybe as a result of, of living in a sinful world, in a world that is plagued by sin, maybe that somehow marred your ability 
to bear children. That doesn't take away from your preciousness in the sight of God. It doesn't take away from your value in society. You may mourn that. And that may just make you long even more for the fulfillment of all of God's good designs in eternity. But you're precious in the sight of God. May it be that all of us learn to value the goodness of God's creative plan. As we see one another made in the image of God. And one day, brothers and sisters, let me tell you, this mortal <laughs> will put on immortality. This perishable will, put, will, will become imperishable. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, we shall be changed. And in that day, Everything that is in us will cry out, it is well with my soul. Let's pray. Father, thank you for just these few moments to look into your word together. I pray that you may cause us to value what you have created for your eternal glory. This we pray in Jesus' name. And together all God's people said, Amen. God bless you.